If you're joining us, welcome. We're just going to give it a few minutes as more attendees continue to enter the webinar. We've got a lot more registered than have come in so far, but um, the good news is that this is going to be recorded. So it'll be accessible if, if you guys see some attendees come in midway, they can access the recording from earlier. Give it about one more minute. Evan, I see that you're on. Can you perhaps do us a favor and shoot out a reminder on social media in case uh, one hasn't gone out today? that our webinar is starting now, that would be appreciated. All right, I'm gonna share my screen and we can get going here. Oops. Okay. So once again, thank you so much for joining us for this NorCal Club Development Webinar, which is hosted by the NorCal Women's Committee, Growing Your Club Membership Through Diversity. And I'm joined by a tremendous panel here today. Uh, our, our format is really gonna be a little bit more of question and answer uh, amongst each of these four women. Um, and we're gonna start out speaking with Brandy Mitchell, who is the founder and director of San Diego Women's Soccer. Give us a little wave there, Brandy. I am. Awesome. Next up, we've got Katie Moe. She's a local top soccer organizer here in NorCal. She has organized a top soccer program in Pleasanton. Hey, Katie. Hey, everybody. And then we've also got, awesome. And then we've also got Carmen Padilla. Carmen uh, works for San Juan South, and she's also on the women's committee, and she has uh, taken the lead on a lot of our Latina outreach and Latinx programming. So Carmen, thank you for joining us. Uh, I am the chair and again, I am going to act a little bit more as the moderator for this webinar. Um, not only where in each of these women answers some questions that we've prepared and, and we've got a slide deck as well, but it's really more about the discussion based format. Um, we are then going to open it up to questions to all of our attendees. So please feel free as an attendee to ask those questions in the Q&A section as the webinar goes along, but we will wait until the end to address all of your questions. So really the big need for us to, um, or, or the recognition of a need for us to host a webinar of this nature is just the, the growing uh, recognition of the critical elements of, of diversity and, and how it can benefit our existing memberships and our communities and particularly through through sport. Um, not only in sport are we working towards a, a common goal and you find more success when we've got people coming from different backgrounds, different life experiences, different perspectives, things of that nature, but it's really a microcosm of life. 
Um, and you just great opportunity, particularly in the last year for us to learn and grow and recognize how we've got to do a better job of incorporating inclusion within our own programs and have that greater impact, like I said, on our communities and throughout society. And you know, the, there are many, many benefits uh, of, of diversity inclusion and inclusion, but you know, some things that we need to think about as club leaders as well, is that by offering this equal access and increased representation um, and, and inclusion-based programming, we're gonna create more sustainable clubs for ourselves and we're gonna grow our membership. Um, that shouldn't be the main driver for why we're doing this, but some tremendous byproducts and benefits of why we need to do this. And there's many ways in which we can create more diverse memberships and clubs. Um, it's not all about creating more of this inclusion-based programming. It's so much more than that. It's about creating a culture within your club. It's about making sure that you have diverse representation at the staff and administrative levels, making sure that your membership has that element of diversity and inclusion. But, but these uh, program-based um, you know, suggestions that we've got for you here today uh, are an element of that. And there are many, many other ideas out there. And when we get to the Q&A section, I invite you to share additional ideas. Um, but these are a couple of unique programming ideas that we've seen are working really well. And not enough of our clubs in NorCal are accessing them. And so we're just hoping that, um, that you consider this, especially as we go into our new season here in a couple months some great opportunities to grow your clubs. So first of all, I'm gonna hand, um, hand it over to Brandy. Uh, and Brandy, like I said, comes from, from San Diego Women's Soccer. And being that our format is a little bit more q and I'm going to, uh, to first ask you, Brandy, to tell us a little bit more about San Diego Soccer Women and, and your journey to form this organization. Absolutely, and thank you for inviting me in. Uh, this this concept of women playing soccer is obviously all over the news and, and part of our day to day uh, information about soccer now with the US women's national team getting so much attention. Um, but actually, since the early 1970s when Title IX passed, women playing soccer at recreational levels, not only in their 20s, but in their 30s, 40s, 50s and older, that actually started because so many women at the time seeing their girls being allowed to play sports for the first time and specifically soccer, uh, because it opened up the game for girls, it actually opened up the game for women. And of course, women have been playing soccer already, but as far as the actual choice to organize into leagues, uh, you know, gain field access and move forward, even, even coming to the point of creating tournaments, that was something that really started in the 1970s. And it's actually, it, it's funny to look at it now for all the attention again that women's soccer is getting, that we have over 40 years of the, the major, the, the main leagues uh, for women's recreational soccer all over from the East Coast to the West Coast and beyond. And for me, I actually had played soccer as a kid. I'm, I'm 40, turning 45 this year. So for me, born in 76, I actually had easy access. I was born in Southern California. So I played soccer starting at age, you know, four or five. AYSO, club teams, you know, anything just within my local community, and then a little bit of travel soccer. So all the way through high school, no big problem gaining access. And it wasn't until after I graduated, chose to go to a college that didn't have a soccer program at all, and realized something that had been part of my life, you know, the entire, my entire childhood, and it was part of my family um, culture too. My dad coached, my mom coached, uh, my mom actually played a little bit too, and my dad coached her team. So it was very normal for me to see women playing soccer and normal for me to see, you know, the culture of families involved in sports. But all of a sudden there was this gap when I was in my 20s. I had two kids and it didn't even occur to me to look for a soccer league. And, and I was in San Diego at that time. So where San Diego soccer women started was basically me realizing with, with so much access on the internet, and this was about 10 years ago, why did we not have a central place that was just a directory that if you wanted to find women's soccer at, at older ages, especially, that I could just provide this one place to look it up. So I launched that website, worked with one specific league to begin with, and then really started to expand. And over the past couple of years, I, I took it a different direction. Instead of just being one directory for the local area, I created a tournament directory for um, age 30 and older women's tournaments and events, um, started including global uh, tournaments and activities, 
And then from there, really kind of finding where these gaps are when we talk about diversity and inclusion, that occurs obviously in adult sports also. So that's kind of my, my background and story with San Diego Soccer Women. Wonderful. And I've learned quite a bit in, in our discussions, even about uh, this access on the local level that I wasn't uh, familiar with because so many of our youth clubs don't have this pathway. Um, but in Northern California, we do offer leagues and tournaments for recreational women's soccer. Can you share about senior games, leagues, and other opportunities locally and throughout the country? Absolutely. And on that next slide, and maybe for future reference for, you know, for attendees, um, this is something that can be shared. This is my understanding. I have connections with women all over the country and try to do my best between Facebook groups and, you know, outside forums and just email communication and going to tournaments and meeting up with women, trying to find out, you know, where, what are the leagues that are maybe not posted online, don't have social media, trying to dig all those up and make sure they're accessible. These are the most obvious ones. Uh, and if you kind of go, I've gone by region. And, and one thing, again, that's, that's unique about what I'm really focused on is this isn't just women in their 20s who get to go out, you know, they were competitive in high school and maybe they're not playing college ball or they're out of college and now they want to continue playing. These leagues in general offer a variety of, of levels and experience uh, levels that would give, you know, either divisions by skill or divisions by age that would give women the chance to really come back and play. Um, there is a bit of a gap in actually playing for the first time and that's something I'm working on down in San Diego. But you can see, obviously, Bay Area with the most number of leagues and events. But again, Sacramento having tournaments that are known throughout the country. And because this community has been built over the past 40 years, and that, again, women's soccer over age 30, there are teams who travel from Virginia, travel from Texas, travel from Massachusetts, and come out to the tournaments here on the West Coast, just as much as some from the West Coast go out to the East Coast. Uh, and, and centrally, like I said, Texas going up to Oregon um, and big programs in Wisconsin. So thinking of it, not only, you know, we have local representation with these opportunities in leagues and tournaments, but understanding that this is actually a nationwide community where you're bringing in, you know, not only from a tourism aspect, but you're bringing in awareness and visibility from all different regions. Uh, and specifically talking about the senior game. So like I said, these tournaments in general have um, not only 18 plus or open divisions, but they would likely have 30 plus, 40 plus, 50 plus. The senior games specifically, there's the, the, na the national senior games, and then we have the California senior games. They're all part of one big network. But the games here in California do offer, most of them offer soccer, specifically women's soccer. And you can see that the Sports for Life is actually considered a senior games tournament, the Bay Area senior games, and then the Sonoma Wine Country games. Those are also, those are three different senior games programs just within Northern California. And they all work on, you know, calendars that try not to affect one another. So you'll see, you know, anywhere between May and maybe September, most of these tournaments would be happening. Visalia is also a senior game that's a little bit earlier in the year. And it's really important to make sure these programs are known because although some of these organizations, the senior games organizations work with like the Council on Aging, um, you know, specifically organizations that target, target older populations. In general, we just need all of the soccer community to understand that these opportunities exist. Senior games generally start at age 50. Uh, some of them do go a little bit younger, but we go, we have divisions all the way through 70 and older. Um, they get filled up. It, those, the, you know, in a tournament, we have plenty of players to be able to, to get a, a full tournament going at that age level. That's fantastic. So in other words, if we were to form teams and add this programming, there's absolutely access to join leagues within Northern California, um, put these teams into existing successful tournaments and, and things of that nature. So, you know, from, from the knowledge that I have of, of what's going on in NorCal right now, we do have WPSL teams, adult teams that um, are predominantly for, for players who played in college or are still playing in college and looking for that additional training um, throughout the year or during the summer. And we do have adult leagues through NorCal, but we really don't see very much in the way of, of this recreational based soccer for women. So this is, this is fantastic. And, and can you then talk on and touch on the benefits that there are to youth clubs adding this multi-generational programming to their offerings? Absolutely. I've, I've done a little research because each women's league that I'm in touch with has a little bit different format. 
Some are associated with U.S. soccer, U.S. Adult Soccer Association. Some are connected to youth leagues. Others are actually connected to semi-pro leagues. Uh, many of them are just privately run. You know, they have their nonprofit uh, status and they have their own board and just run their own leagues. So it's interesting knowing that there isn't one way to run a women's league or an adult league in general. Uh, but but by collaborating, it's it's really amazing how much more can be done rather than running independently. Uh, and I won't go through all of these 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 options here, but you can see I'm talking about the benefits. And, and a lot of these benefits are true just as far as any multi-generational experience. But I do want to emphasize that, you know, it's, it's very well recognized that sports are such a powerful unifier, that soccer specifically globally is something that's used in sports diplomacy. Uh, it's used in situations like post-war, um, you know, peace efforts. It's used to, to bridge a lot of, whether it's religious or cultural differences. So we, you know, here in, in California, that's not necessarily day-to-day -day life, but the bigger picture of what it takes to make sure people can understand each other, um, at least have compassion for one another, then that's something that I think we see by working with different age groups. And, and it doesn't have to be any extreme. It doesn't have to be a five-year-old with a 75-year-old even bringing you know, a 12 year old and a 22 year old and then a 15 year old and a 40 year old, there is some level of understanding that they all have the same love, that they wanna play soccer, they enjoy it, it brings something great to their lives and that's in common. And that is very, very powerful. Uh, and and you know, something I wanna to touch on toward the bottom of that list about preparing athletes for an active life. I noticed that, that one of the main um, targets for, for NorCal Premier it's talking about lifelong soccer. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting watching right now when I work with women in their 60s and 70s and I have a couple in their 80s, that there's this difference of how their bodies were treated when they were younger. So some of them may have been run runners, but weren't necessarily soccer players because that just wasn't an option. They didn't have the option to be girls playing soccer. They, you know, they were already well into adulthood when Title IX came out. So as far as girls now, young people now preparing to be lifelong athletes, there does need to be a whole new level of awareness about wear and tear, whether it's hip joints and knees, uh, ankles, what does it look like for their bodies to heal properly as a young person so that they can actually stay in the game into later adulthood. And then some of these examples that I talk about, uh, you know, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions about them specifically, but it really is not only about bringing visibility and, and partnerships, but how within the culture of your league are you making sure that there's visibility of older women playing soccer um, and not only the professionals. I mean, I, I think that's one thing for me because I was not on a path that I, you know, as much as I was dedicated to soccer and playing through high school, would have loved to play in college. It wasn't a make or break situation for me that I, I had to get into college and go toward, you know, some kind of pro path. I really just loved playing. And I think for young people, we all know the statistics of being able to get into advanced college programs and head towards semi-pro and pro play. But there really is a beautiful place that girls growing into women and the same thing for boys, uh, you know, moving into adulthood as men, that you can continue to play. These recreational leagues and pickup games, they all exist, but it doesn't have to be the end of the road because you haven't gotten into that program that you were looking for. So I think that differentiation between what it looks like to be a U.S. women's national team player and what it looks like to be a recreational player, those are both role models I think we need to, to put out there. Absolutely. Uh, your organization is also very involved in international initiatives. You talked about diplomacy earlier and, and you're, you're partnering and collaborating with Global Goals World Cup and, and organizations that are focused on and founded upon the principles of women supporting each other to break down barriers, uh, leading local sustainable development and, and amplifying, amplifying, excuse me, their call to action. Can you touch a little bit more on some of these organizations and, and with them? give us some additional ideas on that front? Yes, and, and I think, especially up in the San Francisco area, um, also I believe in San Fr or sorry, in Sacramento, there are local United Nations uh, associations offices. And, and what that means is the United Nations, obviously they're, they're a, a global organization, but they do have local associations that, that you can partner up with. And that's something that I chose to do. The pictures you see there 
or in 2018, when I, just from my own personal soccer network of women, I put out a post that said, who wants to go to this field? And that's located in uh, Northern Norway. And once I had enough women who were interested in going, this was like in February, March of 2018, we had a trip scheduled for July. And the first thing I did is reach out to organizations that were connected in two ways, connected to soccer, but also to international partnerships and improving the world um, in a bigger way. And then locally, what could I find with sustainable de development goals? So Global Goals World Cup was the perfect fit for us. Um, and the picture that you see um, with, uh, where we're holding that ball and with the, the background behind us of the Global Goals logos, that was in a New York City event with Global Goals World Cup. So when I partnered with them, I just said, I want to be able to represent this bigger picture of what we need to be working on as humans to make our world a better place. And I know that you're doing it through soccer and I know that you're, you're specifically targeting women and how we can all work together to do, to do this. And so by working with them, it led me in all different directions. And I think that's what's important to understand with your, your local clubs is that by reaching out to something that, that seems like it's not necessarily specific to what you're doing, but gives you access to a network of people. And again, organizations, whether they're nonprofits or private companies, that there, there is so much support in there. And again, specifically around soccer. So for me, I think it became clear that not only was I able to talk to, you know, globally talk to my audience about women playing soccer at older ages, but to justify and, and bring some credibility to the fact that these global goals uh, for our sustainable development, they talk about the things that we're doing, health and wellness, uh, gender equality, inclusivity, uh, reducing inequalities, and, and some of those messages kind of going back into what you talk about at diversity, specifically to older women playing soccer is we have a lot of discrimination that has to do with whether or not we're married, whether or not we have kids, mm -hmm. um, you know, whether our abilities are good enough and, and of course, gender, right? And, and the age side of it is something we all deal with on a regular basis. So I think that my message as far as working with, whether it's specifically the global goals, uh, which, you know, there's information that you can access all over the internet. And there's also, again, local organizations who can support you in this, that finding that bigger picture and making sure not only youth, but the adults in your program adopt some ideals and some, some concepts that make this all, you know, the passion can kind of go in a direction to help everyone. That's great. And Brandy, can you share your, your website? Because I know you've got some additional partnerships of some fantastic organizations on the web there as well. Yes, absolutely. So it's sandiegosoccerwomen.com. And from that website, definitely resources on there. I have a tournament directory. Uh, I will be adding, you know, leagues across the country as I get all of them, you know, put up there. And then uh, there's even, you know, I have some films that you may not have heard of that are specifically to more grassroots women's soccer organizations and also some events that you can find out about. So that's that. I'm on social media, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And then I also do have some smaller Facebook groups that kind of help to unite women. Uh, there is a, a larger one called, I believe it's women's, uh, adult women's soccer. And I don't own that group, but if you have anyone interested in playing at older ages or even any age, then that's a group to join. And I think that's what a lot of this is about is really networking and building partnerships. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Brandy. Really appreciate it. And I'm sure that our attendees are gonna have some questions for you here at the end. Um, but now I'm gonna move, move on to talking Top Soccer with, with Katie Mo. Uh, Katie Mo, as I said earlier, has established programming in the Pleasanton community. Um, and so Katie, can you tell us how you became involved with Top Soccer and what, what it took to start what, to start this program, excuse me, in Pleasanton? No, no problem. Um, thanks for having us and or having me. And uh, Brandy, thank you for sharing that, that your whole presentation was awesome. Um, it got me excited for why my husband and I love our daughters to play and it's so that they can be athletes for life. So I appreciate that. Um, so on that note, I have three kids, three daughters, all girls. My husband played soccer. He still plays soccer. Um, every Sunday uh, morning, he's in the co-ed adult league here in Pleasanton. And I think my kids were on the soccer field watching dad play before they could walk. Um, and so 
for in our family, it was always like, when's it my turn? When's it my turn? Um, we have a daughter who has a genetic disorder. Um, and it was one of those things where when her sisters started to play, how do we get her to play? How do we find opportunities for her to be active, to play sports? Um, so we started to seek that out. There were a couple random unaffiliated programs that we found here in town. And then, God, I think it was maybe four years ago, a neighboring club, um, Fusion in Livermore, they hosted a top soccer event that had a little bit of star power um, in the name of Abby Wombat. Um, so we jumped on board and we're like, whoa, you know, we didn't know top soccer existed. We didn't really know what it was. And we joined, um, the program, uh, that fall and did some fundraising and participated and it was really, really special. So when that happened, I immediately called our board president, um, in, in Pleasanton and said, why don't we have this? <laughs> What's going on? You know, we've got this amazing soccer community here in Pleasanton. This needs to be on our website. This needs to be, we need to have this. Um, so of course he invited me to the board meeting. I showed up and lo and behold, guess who was in charge of top soccer. Um, and it was, it was incredible. We started small. Um, we have a couple community service initiatives through our club that started some clinics and we just um, kind of went for it and learned as we went. The way that I modeled it was for it to follow our rec programming, which is in the fall. I thought that, um, you know, an, an adage that I have picked up along the way as a parent of a special needs child is kind of this all means all mentality. And here in Pleasanton, um, you know, when we kick off Rage, we have, or Ampelistic, our boys programming, we have a parade down Main Street. Like, why can't the top soccer kids walk in the parade? And you've got these kids going, well, I wanna be a part of that. So I broader thinking, trying to figure out a way for these kids to feel like they can wear the same colors that their brothers or sisters or friends wear, whether they play for ballistic or whether, whether they play for rage. Um, so that was always the motivation and the driving force. And um, that's kind of how it started, I guess. And it is a work in progress. I know, um, Aaron, you put in here, which is very true, top soccer programs can have very modest beginnings. I think what I will say to that is um, you really don't know who's going to show up. You don't know um, the level of involvement that you're going to have to have. Um, there are obviously a lot of considerations. And so I do think that having a modest beginning is the perfect way to put it. Um, so that's kind of how I got to top soccer, I guess. Wonderful. And can you tell us a little bit about the impact that you've seen on both the athletes and the coaches yeah. that are involved in the top soccer program in Pleasanton? Absolutely. It's a great question. So I can speak as a parent of a child, as well as, as a, or I guess, program participant as well as kind of an observer, coach, you know, advisor. So what I decided to do is I thought, you know, this is a great opportunity for our own, potentially our own players um, who play either competitive or even recreationally to act as buddy coaches um, to help these kids. So once we kind of got enrollment going, um, and we got to meet the kids, I would reach out to our teams and ask if anyone wanted to participate in this. For me, I'm, I'm always about mentorship and developing leaders and helping our kids be leaders on and off the field. Um, that's a huge passion of mine. And, and so I thought, what a better opportunity than, than to get some of our older, more mature players to come on and just play with these kids. And I will tell you that we had a lot of these coaches, um, in specific, specifically, we had a player who was one of our ECNL players who um, had to leave competitive because of multiple concussions, unfortunately, but love and joy and passion for soccer. Um, devastating. And she is now one of our lead coaches for top soccer. She has found this new love 
and this different way to share her love of the sport with a completely different group of kids. And that to me, high school age, you know, young woman, like that is every time I see her mom, I'm just like, oh, I love your daughter. And it's just really, it's just, that's been a huge gift. So to see that, to see players um, who are, you know, fierce and incredible athletes on the field to come off and, and learn this softer side of soccer, if you will, um, is really been really special. We invite boys and girls. Um, I reach out to boys teams and girls teams because our program participants are male and female. So I think it's important that boys have mentors, you know, that are, if that's what they are attracted to, I just want kids to have opportunities. If they connect with someone, I want that to be there. Um, the biggest goal I think for me that I saw is in the beginning, you have the parents show up with their athletes, the participants, and the parents are on the field. They're holding hands with the kids. Um, they're, they're very reluctant to let go because um, it is, it's a new thing. They don't know much about it. They, you know, as a special needs parent, you're very, very used to always being very hands-on. And what I loved is, you know, we did a six, I think we did an eight week program by like week four or five, the parents just sat on the sidelines and talked and the kids were on the field by themselves, you know, with a buddy coach, with our program coaches. And to me, like that's a gift to give to these parents. They are, you're giving them kind of what many of us as soccer parents see, like we get to show up, we sit on the sidelines, we talk to our parent friends and we watch our kids play and have fun. And to me, I think that was kind of became a secondary goal that I didn't realize I had. And it was to give these parents, you know, 30 to 45 minutes where they just get to watch their child go out there and have fun and complete an obstacle course or play a game. Um, so that was pretty cool too. Fantastic. And, and yeah, I love what you've done and that you've got these coaches who are there session in, session out, the consistency, they're, they're adults, they're more trained professionals, they're coaches Correct. within the club, um, but then bringing in players as well, yeah. um, week in, week out to be assistant coaches or, or to help out in that capacity. Um, it just broadens the impact and is pretty. Yeah. Sick. And I think that on that point, you know, I know that uh, Tracy has a very robust top soccer program. And I believe that they um, actually host a tournament, kind of like a Halloween fun type tournament every October. Uh, I think it's called the Monster Mash or something like that. And, you know, when I look at our program, I think our age participants are much younger. Our average age is like eight, whereas I believe their average age is much older. So as your program grows and changes, I mean, ideally want to be able to seek out those other opportunities. I mean, it would be an incredible goal to be able to take our team and go to a fun jamboree where they get to play with other kids. We're just so much younger, so it doesn't work. So I think that having those, um, as this program grows, hopefully across Northern California, it would be incredible to do that. But I think that having the kind of modest approach, the understanding of who's gonna show up, what kind of support do they need, um, you know, we had a young man show up one of our first years and <laughs> our coach, coach Nina, we looked at each other and we're like, um, he needs to be playing rec. Like he was so good. So we automatically referred him to ballistic and said, can you get this kid on a team, please? Like, you know, he was part of our special education program here in Pleasanton for school, but completely athletically talented. And it was like, he was, he was bored with us <laughs> within the first time. So you just kind of have to adjust as you go and, and each, each year kind of strategically figure out how are we going to grow? Who are our advocates in the community? Who do we partner with? Um, and just kind of make adjustments from there. Wonderful. Well, and I know you've already made several recommendations, but you do you have additional recommendations for those that are considering adding top soccer programming? Um, I think for sure... Um, 
starting small, you know, we, I, I think it's really good. I mean, for me, having a connection to the school district and to the special education program, I think was a little bit, it made it easier for me because I knew the principals at the schools. I knew the teachers personally to try to help promote the program. I think that um, it's hard. People are looking for an opportunity for their kids to have a chance to do this. Um, you just kind of, I mean, we had kids travel from out of, from other cities where top soccer doesn't exist. Um, so it's, I mean, it's kind of hard. I mean, in all honesty, I, it's a very much a case by case. Um, I think that you could look to your city to see if they already have some sort of programming and you could, you know, bounce off of that. Um, and then, and then I, I'm more than happy to be a resource for anyone to talk about case by case, or this is what we're thinking. Um, it, it's, it's kind of hard other than just kind of starting getting the support of your club, getting the support of your organization and trying to find someone in the community that would be a resource to really say, does this need exist and how do we best serve the population? Right. Well, and there again, you just listed a whole bunch of resources. Um, you know, another resource is just the, the top soccer program itself, right? And, and contacting lead, national leadership at the USYS programming. Um, anything you want to say about that or just additional resources? No, I mean, I think I, for me, it was just going to that information. Um, you reminded me, I went to that website first. There's a lot of great information online. Um, at the national level. And then one of the things I did is because when I first started it, it was kind of me leading it. And I did, we didn't have a coach um, who was one of our rage coaches come in and now we do. Um, so I went and met with my daughter's APE teacher. So adaptive physical education. We went and had coffee one day and I talked about what are different drills or things I can do that are soccer related that are adaptive, like adaptive PE. So if you have a resource there, physical therapist, um, an APE teacher at one of your local schools, great first people to talk to because they will be your biggest um, cheerleader and assets for trying to have one of these programs and they're gonna give you great feedback and there's just a resource, a wealth of knowledge of different things that you could do on and off the field for the kids. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Katie. No problem. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Now we want to chat with Carmen Padilla. Um, again, Carmen um, is leading our initiative within the NorCal Women's Committee um, to provide more programming and outreach to the Latina community. Um, but uh, Carmen, can you discuss your journey as a player and, and the support system that you had or perhaps wish you had more of? Um, that led you to play for the, the U-20 and full youth um, Mexican national team, for the U-20 team and the full team for about eight, eight or nine years, right? Yes. So my journey kind of started when my dad decided to immigrate from Guadalajara, Mexico um, to the Bay Area, you know, and the way that he um, created his community was through soccer. You know, he didn't really speak the language. He had a soccer ball and that's how he made friends um, and kind of established his community and so I grew up, like Katie said, on the soccer field with my dad. You know, I had two choices on the weekend, either stay home and clean and cook with my mom or go to the field with my dad um, and be on the sidelines. And I chose um, soccer. I developed a passion for it really young. And um, I'm really thankful that my parents never said I couldn't play, um, that girls couldn't play. They always encouraged me to play and allowed me to. Um, and then, um, my brother also, my younger brother was really good at soccer. And so every day um, after school, we lived in an apartment complex where all the boys would get together and make these massive pickup games. Um, and at first they were a little hesitant about letting a girl join in. Um, but once my brother said he wasn't allowed to play, if I wasn't allowed to play, they kind of um, let me in because my brother was so good. They wanted him on their team. So um, I got a little lucky in that sense as well. So I kind of just grew up just playing pickup games um, in my neighborhood with boys and on the weekend at my dad's games and he coached a men's team. So I kind of developed my passion and, and, and love for the game that way. I played recreationally 
until I was 13. Um, and then a club coach um, named Jose um, saw me at a tournament and said, hey, do you want to come guest play for my competitive team? At that point, I didn't even know what he meant by competitive soccer. I was just like, sure, I'll come play. Um, and that kind of um, helped me excel in soccer. Um, I was able to play competitive soccer where I had coaches who helped find sponsors as my parents were unable um, to pay a lot of the fees associated with playing at that level, um, as well as helping me find rides to practices and to games at times with both parents working. Um, so I really got lucky with the support system that I had as far as um, helping me be able to continue to play. Um, then my brother signed a contract with Chivas in Mexico. And so his agent called my dad and said, hey, we're having our first ever women's um, soccer tournament in Mexico for females. Do you have a girls team? We need one. We can't fill an 18 tournament in Mexico. We're missing a team. So um, he reached out to my club coach and here and behold, we showed up with our team um, to play in this tournament in Mexico. And in the tournament was the U17 women's national team um, was playing and we played against them. And so after that tournament, I was approached about um, asking if I had dual citizenship, which I did since my dad was born in Mexico. And that's kind of how my um, connection started with the Mexican national team. I went out there for a tryout and then I ended up staying for three months for the whole summer while I was out on summer break. Um, played with the U19s in a World Cup in Canada and then from there moved on to the U20s and then the full national team. Just really grateful and honored to be able to represent Mexico and play at a really high level um, and travel the world and just learn and grow not only as a player but as a person. Um, and then the other thing I would say, thank you to my coaches um, that helped me. Um, I was, when I got back from playing with Mexico, I was able to get a scholarship to attend college. I became the first person in my family to attend college and kind of opened the door for my siblings, my cousins, and um, kind of just became um, an advocate in the community to help others like me um, have those opportunities that sp the sport of soccer provided to me. Awesome. And again, you didn't get into organized club soccer until 13, mm -hmm. um, which is really imp an important reminder for, for all of us, right? Um, and, and with that said, there are a lot of barriers to entry uh, for both Latina and Latino youth soccer players for organized youth club soccer. So we mm -hmm. do see a lot of Latinx players playing out on the weekends. But are they involved in organized club soccer? Not as many as you'd think or, or you know, many of us hope to be able to provide for. So can you talk about some of those barriers and what we could do to knock those down? Yeah, I think there are a lot of barriers that restrict access uh, for our Latinx community. And I think it's important to know that one player might be affected by one barrier, might be affected by all of the barriers. You know, every player and family is unique. I think one of the main barriers is um, having non-English um, speaking parents. So that language barrier, being able to communicate effectively um, with parents. So um, having Spanish speaking coaches and administrators that can kind of provide um, information to families and be able to connect with them. Um, I think another big barrier is unfortunately the financial cost of playing club soccer, the pay to play model um, and helping families. I know a lot of clubs in NorCal offer scholarships, um, but then also realizing that um, sometimes, you know, those registration fees or the uniform costs, travel costs, it all adds up and kind of adds to the total cost. So being aware that um, financial um, limitations could also be a restriction, um, as well as immigration concerns. I know um, a lot of times when we ask players for registration info, we ask them for their birth certificate. So which might make them hesitant. Um, they don't have a US birth certificate. Is it okay to use my Mexican one? Are they gonna ask me for my social security number? Um, those kind of concerns. Um, or is it gonna be information that then the government can use against them when they're, they are trying to adjust their immigration status? Um, and going off of that one, just an uneasiness of allowing your children to travel out of state um, or anywhere near the border, um, if you are in one of those situations, um, as well as a lack of medical insurance. Do they have insurance? Do I need insurance to play? So really just um, getting information out there to parents um, to kind of help ease all of these concerns and barriers that they might have 
um, to play club soccer. Right. And there are so many, um, you know, grant opportunities and, and programs out there if, if you spend a little time doing the research um, to help with your lower socioeconomic portion of your community and population. Mm -hmm. um, one, I, I didn't include it in this slide here, but one that um, that has been accessed locally through actually Cal North is called Get on the Bus. It's been a great opportunity to increase that access and and provo provide more <clears throat> programming and fina financial aid. Um, and and uh, Nick Luson has done plenty and would be a great resource uh, to tap in terms of looking for additional grant programs and things like that, that, that NorCal partners with. Um, that said, what, what suggested programming offerings for, for youth clubs do you recommend in order to recruit more players? Um, I think, like you said, you know, there are grants out there, um, maybe offering scholarships, making parents aware that there are those opportunities, um, as well as recruiting more Spanish speaking coaches um, and administrators and also investing in their coaching education, um, as well as offering free clinics, you know, getting them in the door, showing them what the club is all about, uh, maybe having like a club information night. Our, all of our clubs in NorCal um, have amazing programs. So can we get the kids on, on, on the field or in a meeting where we can share all the information, but do it in Spanish so that the parents can understand and know what's going on. Um, just like you said, the, um, Women's Committee is really focused on growing the game for females, um, not only getting more female participation, but also more females involved in coaching and in refereeing. So we have the Latina Outreach Initiative where we um, are offering free clinics for Latina girls in the communities. Our goal is to have one in each of our NorCal regions. And so the idea is we've hosted two so far. We've hosted one at the University of Pacific and one at San Jose State, where the goal is to get Latina girls um, on the college campus and do a clinic um, with some of our NorCal Spanish speaking coaches um, and then have college players join in and help with those as well. And then after our clinic, um, we go and watch the college team play in a game. So kind of exposing them to role models, um, opportunities available through sports um, and um, encouraging them to play and learning about all the um, social and mental and physical benefits of playing the sport. So I think free clinics, offering scholarships, maybe um, trying to figure out a way to um, split up the registration fee. So it's not just such a big upfront cost at the beginning and, and helping in that sense. Um, we actually um, just started at our club um, having a uniform pass down program. So we had a few kids that came in that weren't able to afford um, kits or training kits. So we've asked some of the older age groups, hey, do you guys have um, this player's your same number? Do you have any uniforms that don't fit anymore that you're trying to get um, get rid of that you would love to pass down to a younger player. Um, so we've um, done that as well as we have a team where the majority of the parents are non um, are non English speaking. So any message that goes on on Team Snap, we also send it out in Spanish. Any document, I think NorCal's really done a great job um, translating the documents in English and Spanish, so the parents are able um, to read those and 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 be aware of what's going on. But I would say those are some ideas that we can have to to provide more information and outreach. Wonderful. And as far as the, the Latina Outreach Initiative, which you've taken the lead on with, with the Women's Committee, there's some other pretty cool elements um, that have helped bridge that gap a little bit. During these clinics, uh, you've brought the parents in mm -hmm. and you've had a Q&A forum with them to educate them as well, more on, on what club soccer looks like and, and build some trust and, and just, just help with that educational process. And, and in addition to you know, collaborating with the university and giving a tour of the athletic facilities and, and the university, we've also coupled it with, um, with the women's team. So they're able to watch a game and then before or after that game, interact in the clinic with these women college players. So it's the, you know, if you can see it, you can be it, be it idea. And, and you've done, you've done a tremendous job with that. Um, but, but what have you, why is that so critical to add that question and answer forum with the parents during this, during this clinic? Or these I think clinics it's rather? really, it, I think it's really important. I think, unfortunately, there is a stigma that soccer is a boy thing. And, and, and it comes from a cultural belief um, 
that, you know, women are supposed to stay home and, and, and help with the household and help watch younger siblings. Um, so I think it's really just education, like girl, there are many, um, benefits of women playing soccer, you know, it leads to, um, higher academic achievement, you know, healthier lifestyles, as well as mental benefits and the life skills that they learn. So really just helping, like you said, develop that trust with parents, letting them ask questions and, and kind of know, um, that it's much more than just playing soccer. It's helping develop your, your daughter into a future leader um, that is empowered in our community. Yeah, and, and educating parents and recruiting them has been a critical step through, mm -hmm. through this whole process. And, and I think one that has to be considered when we're looking to recruit more Latinx players. Can you touch on uh, some of the ways that we've been able to recruit some of those Latinx players into our clinics, which you know, give some good ideas into recruiting them into, into clubs? Yes. So when we first started, um, we were trying to figure out how do we get this out? You know, we had a big issue with just posting it online and having parents being able to go online and register. We realized that most parents um, in the target group weren't technology savvy, um, didn't feel comfortable registering online. So what we did is we ended up putting a phone number, say, hey, call this number, we'll help you get registered um, in Spanish. We targeted the local soccer stores in the local community, some restaurants and put up posters and advertisements that way. So kind of just getting into the community and, and, and figuring out where these players are. Um, I think as far as recruiting more Latinx players, I think the first place we wanna start, I think this is where Nicholas Sun started too, is on our sidelines, you know, look at your current teams. Are there sisters of current players just sitting there, you know, invite them to join a training session um, spread information about a team in their age group. Um, I think that's a really great place to start. Another great place to start is in the schools and the underserved communities. You know, can you reach out to those um, principals and get inside those communities? Um, and we actually also went to a flea market and handed out flyers. We went to a local park down in a in a um, in one of these underserved communities and handed out flyers there as well to kids playing pickup soccer. So I think there are ways to do it. Um, there's a lot of talent out there that I think um, is, um, could be very helpful to our clubs in NorCal. We just have to get out there and recruit um, and provide information. Absolutely. And, you know, NorCal has started this Latino committee. It's, it's been, what, about two, three months. Um, and so it's been created to support and, and positively, positively impact the Latino communities within, within NorCal Premier. Um, and so we recommend that you look a little bit more into that as well. They've got their own social media presence yeah. and, and information on the NorCal website there too, so. Yeah, so, and if anyone wants to join um, our Latino committee, um, just reach out to us, you know, we're really working on um, increasing coaching education opportunities in Spanish, as well as providing programming for our Latinx players, as far as um, college awareness, college, how to complete the financial aid process, the process for dreamers. Um, so a lot of good information and webinars, ideas that we're starting to come up with to kind of help the Latinx community. So well, again, if you want to join, we're happy to have you. And then if you have any suggestions, um, that we may be missing, um, we're happy to hear them as well. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Carmen. And uh, now I'm gonna go ahead and, and turn it over to our attendees. And if you guys have any questions, would love to open them up to our fantastic panelists here. I'm gonna go ahead and, and read them. So first we've got Val. Are the teams made up of only players with disabilities or are they mixed with players without disabilities? We would love to start a program like this, but don't know how big the interest would be to begin. That would be for you, Katie. Um, thank you for the question. So for us, we definitely have a more inclusive integrated approach because we have this buddy coach program. So the kids get out there and we try, in all honesty, we try to have a one-to-one -one ratio, at least from the get-go. So each player, each top soccer player has a buddy coach who just runs around and plays with them and goes through the drills with them. And at the end of each game, once you figure out kind of the abilities and the attention span and that sort of thing, um, then we will or do more of an organized game. And I would say it's definitely mixed 
mostly because they want to play with the buddy coaches. They want to model their behavior. They want to be with them. Um, they want to show off. And so it, it is definitely an integrative, inclusive approach. And that's what's worked best for our group. It could be different, again, based upon the abilities of your players. Wonderful. We've got another question here uh, asking if, if we've given thought to a town hall informational session hosted in Spanish that could be beneficial and, and well received and well attended. Um, I do know, Carmen, that we have coaching education mm -hmm. sessions available in Spanish. Um, but what are your thoughts on, on putting something together that's more accessible to members, not just clubs, um, to help educate uh, the Spanish speaking population within our communities? I think that's a wonderful idea. Actually, we have a Latino committee meeting today. I'll, I'll bring that up with them. That's a great suggestion. I think it's just important. The more information and outreach we can get out there, um, I think will help um, eliminate some of these barriers and um, get more kids playing soccer. And, and I think that's the big important thing here. So that's a great idea. We are working right now on creating, you know how NorCal has a women's committee page with everything that we're doing. We are working on committee, on building one for our Latino committee and having um, all the webinars that we have in Spanish available then kind of making it like a library of resources so that parents can go and find the documents that they need in Spanish and so forth, so. I have a, I have a follow up question to that, Carmen. That was my question. <laughs> um, I would wonder what would be the three or four most important things if you were going to have a dedicated page on your club website that was translated in Spanish, what would be the most important information, like understanding that most people spend a minute and 30 seconds on someone's mm -hmm. website, what are the three most important things that we can put out there to keep them engaged and get them wanting to learn more? About your club? Yeah. I think a lot of the times, um, we've faced the issue where they're not going to really get the stuff from the website. They're going to want to come and see. We've had, we had a young lady we found playing in the um, local league with Mexican boys that the parent wanted to come out and watch the training. He wanted to come out and talk to us. So I think it's going to be more building that trust maybe okay. in person. So maybe putting contact information to somebody they can contact in Spanish yep. and they can ask those questions and then set up an appointment to come out to watch practice. I think that would kind of be maybe the best way to do it. Okay. Yeah. That makes, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. And I just want to add the one thing we all have in common is this concept of outreach mm -hmm. that, you know, for, for an older population, you know, how do I find women in their thirties, forties, fifties, sixties, seventies, who they're at home right now, they love to play soccer, but have never heard, you know, we don't, they maybe haven't just put in the search terms to find it online. They didn't realize these programs existed. They hadn't seen us playing at a park. So the one thing I want to say to everyone out there is it's easy to say, well, we haven't had that request. You know, no one's asked us for a program that includes um, special populations. No one's asked us, right? But these people exist no matter what. We've already proven it over and over and over that, that there are kids, there are adults who want to be involved. And until you create a program, even through a survey, even just sending out to your current demographic, you know, your, your current database saying, is this something that you may want to be involved in and start getting some initial interest. But, but I hear all the time, you know, new soccer facilities will open up and I'll look on their website and it's men's, 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 men's. And I'll say, I see you're not offering a, a women's program. No one said that they wanted one. Yeah. Right. And it's like, <laughs> why is that not the default? Right. So I think for, for, you know, amongst ourselves, it's the same experience that it, you have to be an advocate and an ally just starting from the beginning. Just expect that there's a population you can serve and then make it happen. I love that. So true, Brandy. And, and that's, I'll tell you what, that's what we're going to do in our club because you, you think about it, every player has, if not one, others, mother, grandmother, aunt, mm -hmm. another woman on the sidelines in some sort of uh, supporting capacity who, if we ask them if they want to play, I think we'd be pretty surprised mm -hmm. that, that a lot of them would want to, and we could easily create some programming and the community outreach that, that comes from that. And, and just the growth as well, uh, throughout not only our club, but our communities, I, I think it could ex explode in some pretty interesting and fun ways. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. So, um, Anybody else have any questions for our panel? Now would be 
now would be the time to go ahead and plug them into those into that chat bar into that Q and A. And if you don't, I guess I, I will just turn it over to each of our panelists one more time. If you've got any any closing remarks, I know you ju you just threw that out there, Brandy. But if, but if you have any closing remarks, uh, would love to hear from you again. I think. I, looking at my listing that I have within these slides, uh, these are all available on Google search. So if you are, whichever region you're in, type in Recreational Women's Soccer League and look for what's out there already. And a few of the points that I had made that, that again, kind of go with what we're all saying is there's so much to gain by including, there's so much to, to by making that again, the default, that it's not about, okay, this is what we expect to set up for and how can we add these others in, but how can we just create these systems that all work together, that we're all integrated, whether it is an inclusivity model of kind of a larger program with sub programs or whether it is more integrated then that I think we just have to start thinking a whole new way about how we're serving our populations and expecting participation rather than assuming it's gonna just be too hard. Great. Katie or Carmen? I'll just say real quickly, I everything that Brandy said hits home mm -hmm. and it's very true. It applies to all of these um, groups. And I think for me with Top Soccer, specifically, um, you know, just getting started and you just got to roll with it. And I think that knowing that this program is out there and being just being willing to make it happen and, and adjust and apply um, different, you know, adaptations as you go along. It, it goes a long way and it doesn't matter. It's just the idea of getting out there and giving people an opportunity to get started. And um, I'm, like I said, I'm more than happy to, um, if anyone has any questions, please reach out. I know my information's on the RAGE website. I'm on the board of directors with Pleasanton RAGE. Um, and if Aaron, if you follow up, please feel free to share my email. I'm more than happy to answer questions. Wonderful. Yeah, and I think like Brandy said, you know, you don't have to speak Spanish um, to join the Latino committee. You know, we want allies, we want people to want to join our program to help create that access. You know, the more of us there is, the more larger our reach is going to be. So anyone is welcome to join. We'll, we'll be happy to have you. Uh, same with the Women's Committee. Um, we are really passionate about growing the game for women and for the Latinx community. And so if you want to be an ally, go ahead and contact us and, and we'll keep working together. Fantastic. Uh, we did have another question come in as, as you ladies were chatting. Um, <clears throat> Emily's asking if all of these organizations are interested in having college teams reach out about how to volunteer or collaborate. And um, you guys can go ahead and add, add to this if you <laughs> like, but absolutely. Um, we, Amen. Like, <laughs> we touched on this earlier. We um, have very much uh, looked to partner with and collaborate with mm -hmm. colleges and universities with women's teams at the two-year and four-year level for our Latina outreach clinics and that kind of programming. Um, but for this additional programming, it would be absolutely tremendous, a great way to, um, again, follow along with that. If you can see it, be it model and just get a more of a unified, um, you know, effort going here. Uh, so if you are a college coach, yes, Emily, I see you're at Maritime. Uh, I, I don't know if, if you were on our list uh, when we were reaching out to, to colleges, if you were there at that time for the collaboration with Latina Outreach, but we will absolutely uh, reach out on all fronts here moving forward and put you in touch with, uh, with other clubs who are looking to add this programming. And, and a less obvious from my point of view, something I started here is doing beginner training for women and I just volunteer my time to get out there. I am not trained as a coach, but I can make up drills. I can, I can get them out moving around and learning the game. And that's one thing that you really don't see so much is volunteer coaches to teach adults. Uh, and, and I believe there are plenty of men at older ages who would love to play who just didn't have the chance uh, for whatever reason. And so that's something to look at as we add on, you know, it doesn't seem obvious in women's leagues that you would want volunteers. And that, that is generally true that that wouldn't necessarily be needed. But when it comes to, again, outreach and where, you know, you may be at a park that you see a youth team playing, well, side by side, a college student can be teaching all the parents, you know, right over there in the same space during the same session. The kids are seeing their parents active. The kids are starting to relate to what it feels like. But the parents are also realizing 
this game isn't so easy that they can sit on the sidelines and yell what to do. You know, once they try it themselves, it, it usually gives them a different perspective. So that's, that's one opportunity that, you know, when we talk about, again, this, this concept of collaboration and compassion, that it, it does make a big difference. Great educational process as well, right? I love it. It's <laughs> great. Awesome. Well, I don't see any other questions coming through. Uh, again, this was recorded. It will be emailed out to you as uh, in addition to the presentation and any contact information that we've got for you. We will send that to you and to anybody who registered for this event. And the recording will also be posted on YouTube. So really appreciate everybody for attending. And thank you so much to our distinguished panel and these, these great women love have, having had the opportunity to spend some time with you today and look forward to continued partnerships. Thank you, Erin, so thank much. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye-bye.